Uh, we've got some excellent speakers. We've got a theme today, which is testicular cancer and RPLND. Um, I'd like to welcome our, our first speaker, who is uh, Mad Shabir, he's a consultant at Guys and St. Thomas's Hospital. He's worked with me as one of our fellows at UCLH, who's one of our best fellows, I must admit, that we had over the years. And it was very sad to see him go, but I'm glad that he's come back here uh, to come along and talk to us about uh, testicular cancer and fertility preservation. Thank you very much, Madge. Uh, thank you very much, Asif. Um, so, the testis. 80% of what makes up the testicle are the seminiferous tubules, and these are involved in sperm production. So it goes without saying that if you end up having a condition that affects this area, it's going to affect your spermatogenesis. But just how common is infertility in testis cancer? Well, if you look across the range of the different studies which have been published, it's approximated as being 50% of patients who have some degree of infertility, but about 10% of patients will have no sperm and be completely azeospermic at first presentation. Why is this important? Well, of course, testis cancer affects a young cohort of men. The incidence of the disease is increasing, and over the last 30 years, it's almost doubled. But our treatments are also becoming more successful. So as a consequence, we're getting more patients younger, surviving their cancer, and looking forward to a normal, healthy life afterwards. Infertility by itself causes a significant impact on patients' psychological health and also their levels of well-being and depression. If you superimpose the development of infertility on top of a cancer diagnosis, it creates an even bigger stressful situation, both for the patient and their partner. So why does infertility occur in testis cancer? Is it just related to the tumour, or is it also related to the treatments that we subject patients to? Well, it's a combination of both. But of the two, our treatments are probably the bigger cause of the trouble. So with the testis tumours itself, is it about how the testis is formed, or is it the damage to the testicle from the tumour? Well, again, a combination of the two. Skakebak first uh, coined the phrase of testicular dysgenesis, this syndrome where you have altered Leydig cell and Sertoli cell function, which leads to this syndrome of developing the undescended testis, reduced sperm count, and testicular germ cell tumors. And there's certainly an epidemiological and biological connection between testicular cancer and infertility. As far as testis damage goes, again, the tubules which are affected by the cancer will reduce their functionality, and as a consequence, you'll have less spermatogenesis. And there are some studies which have shown that there is a correlation between the preoperative FSH at first presentation and their fertility capacity afterwards, although not to the chance of finding sperm with surgical sperm uh, retrieval techniques. But what about the treatments? Like we said, the treatments have a bigger impact than the actual tumour itself. What about orchidectomy? Does that impair your sperm count? Well, this study by Rivers looked at patients who'd had sperm banking done prior to their orchidectomy and then took the same patients and sperm banked them again subsequent to that and prior to any chemotherapy. And they found that there was a significant fall, as shown in the graph, in their total sperm count of those patients. And in fact, they found that the patients who were azeospermic, the rate of azeospermia doubled. Very low in this series from 3% to 6%, but are doubling nonetheless. Other studies have shown that up to 50% of patients have a decrease in their sperm counts after orchidectomy alone, and up to 1 in 10 men may become azeospermic as a consequence of just the orchidectomy. So it makes you think, should we be doing something even prior to the orchidectomy at first presentation? And is there any evidence to back this up? Well, recently there's been a number of papers which have looked at the histological specimens of cancer testicles which have been removed to see if there's any spermatogenesis in the adjacent areas to the tumour. And in fact with a high degree of concordance in the different studies, they find that there is spermatogenesis in about two-thirds, if not greater than two-thirds of patients. Interestingly, the, uh, the, the chance of finding focal areas of spermatogenesis is not related to the type of tumour or the tumour markers, but is dependent on the amount of normal tubules that you'll see within the testicular volume. RPLND, I'm not going to focus on too much or the effect of this because that's going to be covered later on in the session, but just to say that if you were to develop any problems with anti-grade ejaculation or retrograde ejaculation after the surgery, then there are still options at getting fertility. And these are centered around using vibro-ejaculation devices like the Ferticare device or electro-ejaculation techniques uh, such as uh, shown here in the picture. And these can get successful sperm retrieval rates of about 60% alone, but if this fails, we can still go back into a surgical sperm retrieval directly from the remaining testis. Chemotherapy probably has the biggest impact of all the different treatments that we subject patients to for testicular cancer. And of the agents that we use, the bleomycin and netoposide have a very low risk of causing damage to the testicle or impairing spermatogenesis. It's the platinum in the BEP therapy that has the biggest effect. 
And of the two, cisplatin has a greater effect than the carboplatin by itself. It is a dose-dependent uh, rate of damage to the testicular germ cells, and as a consequence, patients are advised to use alternative contraception for at least the first six months after they've had that form of chemotherapy. But what about that dose-dependent effect? Is there any evidence to say how much uh, reduction you can get and how long you have to wait to see some recovery? Well, this study by Bujan, published in 2013, looked at exactly that. And they found that if you had less than two cycles of BEP chemotherapy, then actually you would get back to your pre-operative levels of sperm count by 12 months. And that was achieved in about 80% of patients. If you gave someone three cycles of BEP of more, and you looked at their outcome at 12 months, considerably worse. And these patients were taking up to 24 months to get back to where they were to start off with. And it wasn't achieved in the same number of patients. It was only about 60% of patients. They also found in that study that the patients who had a worse outcome were those who had lower total sperm counts to start off with and those who had other factors associated with infertility alone, such as a history of undescended testis. But again, the type of tumour didn't seem to have any bearing on the outcomes. Radiotherapy can have two different effects, a direct gonadotrophic effect or the scatter effect from pelvic radiotherapy. You don't have to give much radiation to the testicle to cause damage. And just five gray in a single dose of the testicle can cause prolonged azeospermia, which can take more than five years to recover. If you look at hyperfractionated doses, so just two and a half gray in a fractionated dose can actually cause more damage than five gray of a single dose. If you look at the doses that we use to treat patients who have ITGCN, 16 to 18 gray, that is enough to cause permanent azeospermia in about 95% of patients. What about scatter from treating the radio retroperitoneal field? Well, this can also affect the testicular function, but less dramatically so, with most patients getting back to their pre-treatment levels by about 24 months, and again, in about 80% of patients, although this can be minimized by shield in the gonadal region. So when a patient first presents with testicular cancer, often fertility is the furthest thing from their mind. They're more focused on the diagnosis, if they're gonna make it through and come out on the other side. But knowing what we know, we need to be able to focus on their fertility because it is going to be an issue for afterwards. Our best outcomes for fertility preservation are going to be tackling it prior to them having any form of treatment. And the simplest way to do this, semen cryopreservation. It's widely available, it's cheap, it's effective. All you need to do is just send off the viral screen markers, hepatitis B, C and HIV, refer them to the fertility center locally, and they will get sperm bank within seven days. But if you look at the typical pathway of a patient who comes through with testicular cancer, this is what they usually go through. And although doing sperm banking prior to orchidectomy is favored, it doesn't usually happen at that time course. It usually happens prior to chemotherapy. And if that happens, how are you going to pick up those patients who have impaired sperm counts to start off with? How are you going to pick up on those azeospermic patients? And we've all come across those scenarios. And what about this testicle that's been removed, now sent down to the pathologist in a pot of formaldehyde, and it's got normal tubules inside? We could have done something with that. And what can we do to help that further? So you've got the tumour in the centre, but to the north and south of it, there are normal seminiferous tubules. And it comes to mind that when we're thinking about the testicles, we should probably treat them no differently than we do other paired organs within the urological system. We certainly wouldn't think about doing a sort of an operation on the kidneys unless we knew what the uh, renal function was like beforehand. So why should we consider doing surgery here if we don't fully understand what the function's like before we do any surgery or treatments? Now, if you look at the recommendations from the EAU guidelines about tests that should be done in someone who's being diagnosed in the stage of testicular cancer, this is the typical list, and this is what we all typically do. Fertility investigations are highlighted here, but they're not considered to be an absolute essential prior to the orchidectomy. And this is where I think we need to make a change. I think there probably needs to be a paradigm shift, not necessarily in everyone, but it's not difficult to just do some additional blood tests at the time of doing your tumour markers. And if you did an FSH and it was elevated, it may highlight the fact that this patient has problems with their fertility. If their fertility is otherwise unknown, always be suspicious. If they have any risk factors associated with low fertility, be suspicious. And maybe we should be doing what we're doing here. Uh, so if you look at the blocks in black, at the time of doing your preoperative tumour markers, Maybe we should be checking the FSH, LH, and testosterone at that stage and doing the viral screen so we're prepared for their fertility before any surgery. We can then send them off for a semen analysis if their FSH is raised or if there is those factors of having an unknown fertile status or any risk factors for infertility. And if they turn out to have azeospermia or severe oligosyspermia, we can proactively manage them prior to their orchidectomy and maybe do something different at the time of their orchidectomy. And I just wanted to highlight three special conditions that we come across. The patient who's azeospermic after treatment azeospermic at presentation, and the patient who has cancer in their solitary functioning testis. Well, for the patient who's azeospermic after treatment, we can now offer them things like a micro-TZ, 
Uh, this technique is excellent at being able to find isolated areas of spermatogenesis under the high power microscope at times 20 magnification. And these isolated dilated tubules that you can see here at the bottom, they can be individually picked out, handed over to the embryologist live in theatre, and they can tell you if there's sperm there or not. Overall success of this technique is about 50%. But what about in patients who've had chemotherapy before? Well, even in that setting, it can be successful. The, the studies that have been published have, have been uh, available since the, the, uh, for the last 15 years. And the numbers remain very, very low, but they all have the same message. Sperm can be found, even in patients who've had chemotherapy 10 to 18 years beforehand and remain azoospermic on their semen samples. What about the patient who's azoospermic on presentation? What can we do for them? Well, here we can think about doing something called the oncological testicular sperm extraction, or oncoteasy. And the way that we do this at Guy's is by doing a radical inguinal orchidectomy as you would do ordinarily. And as soon as the testicle is removed from the body, we do a, a table-side dissection with the operating microscope immediately. And you can see in the picture how the tumor is being reflected to one side. And then we're searching the tubules on the inferior aspect of the normal testicle and searching under increasingly high pyre magnification until you find the isolated tubule. And then you check that has spermatogenesis by passing it over to the embryologist in, in theatre. And again, this technique has been described for some years, from as early as 2003. But if you look at the vast majority of the data that's available, it's based on single cases. These are some of the highest numbers of the, of the studies which are available, and there is no uniformity in the techniques used or how it's been done. Some are reporting on conventional TZ, some are reporting on micro TZ, some are in vivo, some are ex vivo. And we don't know the answer is what's going to be the best approach. And further collaborative studies are going to be the way to go. But the key message is you can find sperm in anything up to 75% of patients. The other thing is, you know that if you do this at the time of removing the testicle, and if you don't find sperm, you know you can go to the other side, and you can do a contralateral micro TZ, either in the same setting or a subsequent setting. And what about the patient who has the cancer in the solitary functioning testis? Well, here it's all about preserving the function that they have, not just for fertility, but also for testosterone production. And if the tumor is amenable to it, we can consider a partial orchidectomy. And here this shows removing the tumor and then taking biopsies from the bed of that tumor to make sure there's no surrounding uh, spread of the cancer or ITGCN. And you can even do a sperm retrieval at the same time and preserve the rest of that normal functioning testicle. So just for the last few moments, I wanted to highlight some cases that uh, are examples. These are all real cases from the last 12 months. First was a 36-year-old man who presented with testicular cancer from another center. He'd already had a radical orchidectomy done and had subsequent chemotherapy. He was never offered sperm banking prior to his radical orchidectomy, but was sent in the typical fashion to have it done prior to the chemo. But when he went, he was azoospermic. He went on to have BEP, and he had three cycles of BEP chemotherapy, and then represented two years afterwards still azoospermic, looking to, to seek alternative fertility potential. His FSH was elevated at 45 and testosterone was borderline at 10. So in this patient, we did a micro TZ of his solitary testicle. And it, even the fact that he had Sertoli cell only on, on the histology taken from that testicle, um, we had a successful sperm retrieval and he's currently undergoing IVF with ICSI. But the option here would have been, if he had had that attempt at sperm banking done prior to that first orchidectomy, we would have maybe been able to pick up the fact that he was azoospermic then and offered him an onco -tz and maybe avoided this future surgery on the contralateral normal testis. Second patient was a 33-year-old man who had a large tumor in a solitary testis, in fact, taking up 90% of that testicle. He again was azoospermic when he presented for his preoperative sperm banking and had elevated FSH to go with this. In this particular patient, given the size of the tumor, it wasn't suitable for a partial orchidectomy. But what we did do for him was a radical orchidectomy with an ex vivo onco -TZ at the same time. And even though this, he only had 10% of normal looking tubules, we were able to successfully find sperm and freeze that tissue for future use with IVF. And he's subsequently been started onto testosterone for his uh, anarchic state. And the last case was a 27 year old gentleman, a chap who presented, he had pain in a small atrophic testicle which had been injured in his late teen years with a significant injury on a bicycle accident. He presented with a pain on that side, but actually when we did the ultrasound scan he had this lesion on the opposite side, an incidental 1.5 centimeter uh, lesion um, which was vascular and suspicious. Um, uh, his markers were normal and he went off for preoperative sperm banking which again showed azoospermia. Ele his FSH was slightly elevated at 13 and again, these three cases highlight the fact that the FSH doesn't seem to have any bearing uh, on your success of finding sperm with surgical sperm retrievals. But with this particular patient, we opted to go for a partial orchidectomy and with a concurrent onco at the same time. 
And this patient had complete excision of the, uh, of the tumor, successfully turned out to be a small seminoma with a clear margin and no evidence of ITGCN in the rest of the biopsies. We had a successful surgical sperm retrieval at the same time and the tissue was subsequently frozen. And because he's retained his testis, he has a normal uh, hormone uh, function and doesn't need any hormone replacement. And that's his ultrasound afterwards. So in summary, fertility preservation in testis cancer is important to address from the outset. I think there needs to be a shift in the paradigm of what we do to thinking about function before we do any treatment. And if we can preserve fertility prior to orchidectomy, that would be the, the ultimate goal. Preoperative sperm banking is the most effective. It is also the most cost effective, uh, most effective and cost efficient. But it also allows you to pick up those patients who are going to have problems and allows you to go for alternative approaches, maybe in specialist centers, that can limit the effect of the surgery that you do and preserve their fertility for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maj. Um, any questions from the audience? Uh, Seth Minas on microphone one. Maj, that was a fantastic talk. Really great talk. Um, just a couple of points. One was surrounding the in vivo versus ex vivo. So obviously, you've got your data there. I mean, there's limited numbers in all of those series. Yeah. But um, you also quoted a series, of course, that you know we've done. Your own, and yeah. ours are much lower with in vivo, most of those cases, as opposed to ex vivo. So which, which is the better technique, in vivo or ex vivo, do you think? Yeah, so, so logically, from my point of view, it seems that ex vivo would probably be better because once you remove the testicle completely, you can be more radical in how you're searching. You're not worried about the tumour itself. It's removed from the body. There's no kind of cause or concern about causing any tumour spill or anything else. So I think, personally, from my point of view, I prefer the ex vivo approach, but we don't know the answer because, as you say, the numbers are so low, the studies are so mixed, and I think if we had some form of doing a head-to-head -head comparison between in vivo versus ex vivo, we'd be able to answer that better. But logically, to me, it seems that ex vivo would be a better approach. And the second question, very briefly, is about the, the pathology or the mm. etopathogenesis of the azospermia or impairment of spermatogenesis. Now, aside from those patients that clearly have raised beta HCG, who can clearly have, uh, which can clearly have effects on spermatogenesis, what do you think the underlying pathology is in terms of these patients who clearly present with tumours who are azospermic? Do you think it's the volume of the tumour or do you think there's another process that's going on? So, it's a good question. I mean, it, it all goes back to that, those original slides. You know, is this due to the, the mass effect of the tumour destroying the seminiferous tubules, just a decrease in the bulk of normal functioning tissue? Or is there some greater thing here that we haven't quite figured out? Is this more of that testicular dysgenesis syndrome that was described by Skakibak? And certainly there is that link between those patients who have infertility having that higher rate of testicular cancer. Is this this unknown factor that we haven't quite figured out who has it and how often it's going to be seen? Okay. David Nicol. Can I ask, um, very good talk, and I think you brought up excellent points. I'd just like to know, do you have any thoughts on how we can resolve what does become an issue of tension? And one of the problems that we see a lot is this inability of people to be able to access the andrological services, given that the guidelines for testis cancer actually dictate that this is done at a district general hospital on the next available urology list, which is the stipulation. So people are trying to do the right thing by the pathway, and yet, I mean, realistically, it adds probably 10 days. I know theoretically it can be done, but it mm -hmm. adds about 10 days to the pathway to go through the steps that you've outlined because just an FSH and LH takes several days. If you're going through it methodically, it does take that length of time. And then patients are caught because sometimes there's regret that they didn't have it offered, yet yeah. the institution actually didn't feasibly have a mechanism of doing it. Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing to come out of this is it's just a change in the way of thinking. Because at the moment, if you look at the most people who are having orchidectomies, they don't have their FSH checked beforehand. Mm -hmm. I think if we pick up those patients who are most likely to need this, we can focus on those in greater detail. And they're not going to be a large proportion. So mm -hmm. the truly azospermic patients are, are you know, approximately one in 10 of the subgroup that we're going to see. But if we did that blood test at the same time as the tumour markers, we can identify them. And in most centres, FSH should come back within a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And if that patient gets picked up, and if they get a rapid referral in, and we've, we've had a couple of patients who've been referred in as tertiaries rapidly, and we've managed to get them in and do their surgery with the orchidectomy and oncotesi within the week, in fact. Yeah. So that's the whole idea being people being tuned in at the DGH level to think about fertility beforehand. If you've picked up that red flag, call it into the local specialist center, whoever that may be, and they will have an accelerated process for being able to help you get through that pathway. Because those patients who do have, as you said, exactly that right word was regret, those patients who come through the other side really feel hard done by. Madge, can I ask you one question? It was an incredibly challenging talk, fantastic talk, well done. Is there anybody you wouldn't do a sperm count on before orchidectomy? 
Uh, or do you think, that is, is your shift gone so far that you think you shouldn't do an orchidectomy without knowing what the sperm count is? I mean, I think, you know, if you've got a patient who's clearly completed his family, you know, and he's quite happy about the situation, he's not someone who would have thought about sperm banking anyway, and he's aware that whatever situation he has, if it's an unknown, it's going to get worse, well then, you know, it's all about rationalisation of resources. Okay. What about somebody with a normal-sized contralateral testicle? You know, they've got a testis tumour on the left, and the right testicle feels a good, firm, bulky testicle. Do they need it, do we? Yeah, well, I'd say you can't go by testis, testis volume by itself. Okay. Because we do come across patients who can have a normal testis volume and still have non-obstructive azeuspermia. Okay. But doing that FSH will give you a marker of what's going on with their function. So the size by itself doesn't give all the clues. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Peter Albers, who's the professor of uh, urology in uh, Dusseldorf in Germany. I love Peter Albers. He just makes difficult surgery look easy. He's got fantastic understanding of urology, and all conversations with him are always terrific. He speaks well, and I think you'll enjoy the next 15 minutes. Peter, the floor's yours. Thanks, Tim, Dr. Manier. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, Greetings from the continent. <laughs> <laughs> Manchester was already prepared this morning. And uh, well, it was really a shock for us um, to have heard about this decision. Um, the second shock, the second hit in the cancer theory was that the new Titanic met Iceland. <laughs> and uh, we'll overcome this, I promise you, and we stick together, and I think in scientific community this will not change anything. So let's go to business. Um, the, the problems we have to fix in Europe, uh, we also have to fix in this kind of surgery. So post chemo and d is not an easy thing to go, and I would like to report some of my impressions over the last years. Um, in indications, a uh, little bit on fertility and nerve sparing, and of course of complications. So let's start with the indications. I think a lot of things have changed, and um, you always have to ask yourself, um, do ev does everybody need this kind of surgery? Actually, if you go through all the files, 50% of the patients does need surgery. They have necrosis after chemotherapy. Chemotherapy was successful. Unfortunately, we cannot detect these patients, and um, we will miss some of them that remain with viable cancer. This is usually less than 10%. But a new feature which is coming up is we're going to miss um, teratoma elements that will succeed or will, will develop into malignant transformation. And this is a dangerous disease, and uh, not everyone is aware of this. Uh, of course, we can diminish follow-up investigations when you have cleared the retroperitoneum, but this is a minor issue. Um, so a simple teratoma um, can be removed, um, usually technically it's feasible, um, but 25% of those patients will recur, and this patient, in spite of having been cleared, died lately on a primitive noreactodermal um, tumor, a malignant transformation of a little teratoma rest in his pelvis. So this kind of surgery is tough, this kind of surgery has to be complete, and um, on the other hand, we have to ask ourselves, um, do, does really everyone needs this? This is a huge seminoma. It's a classical impression of a seminoma, which responds usually quite well to chemotherapy. Um, and for some years ago, there were helpful informations on PET scanning in these seminomas. However, if you look this paper uh, from Maria de Santis uh, very closely, you see the PET scan results get more accurate the longer you wait after chemotherapy. So this is six weeks. We now wait 10 weeks. And why do we so? Because 12 to 20% of those seminomas will be false positive. So this guy again responded well to chemotherapy, then a PET scan was done with FDG and an uh, undebatable spot was seen on the PET scan um, directly in the center of the mass. So to that time we decided to get histology of this and this usually ends up in disasters. Mm -hmm. Um, this patient um, got an ileal ureter because of this, and everything was necrotic, so surgery was completely senseless. And uh, that led us to look our series up. To that time, we had about 300 post chemos, and 22 of them had seminoma in the beginning, and 11 had a um, FDG PET before, and seven out of these 11 patients had false positive um, signals. 
but the results you can see with a considerable um, uh, morbidity of surgery. So that brought us to this um, paper that we suggest now a new pathway for those seminoma patients. Um, if you see a mass with a positive signal and it did not progress or even shrank, um, you should repeat the PET scan. Um, and if this does show the same picture, then you should not go on and um, pro proceed with surgery, but then you can go on with surveillance. Actually, the only real indication to perform surgery on a seminoma patient is when they have a stand in and you cannot remove the stand because the ureter was obstructed by the tumor. And in those cases, I do a ureterolysis. And this is not tumor surgery. It's nothing to do with post chemo, but this is the only indication I perform surgery in seminoma. Um, Non-seminoma is a different issue. Um, as I told you about the teratoma problem, um, this is about 40% of patients. Another 10%, 15% is vital, and the other half is necrotic. However, as already said, we cannot predict those patients. If you look through all the series, and every single center has done this worldwide, um, the volume of the residual cancer is not an exact denominator of vital cancer in this residual disease. Even in less than five millimeter, you can find viable cancer and teratoma. Um, of course, um, you can observe those patients because um, with a 95% chance of not getting a relapse, this is a, um, a viable option. However, um, you have two series. This is one from Canada with 270 patients and 15 months, 15 months of follow-up. Um, they showed already a 6% recurrence rate. And the Indiana series with 140 patients showed exactly the same 10% recurrence rate um, that we have seen from our histology results. So you just have to wait long enough. And this means for the patients that they need lifelong observation instead of surgery. Um, so I'm usually above one centimeter, definitely pro-surgery. Around one centimeter, my decision is a little bit dependent on the primary histology. Because you put patients on danger, um, you see the disease-free survival is only 75% because some of them develop this malignant transformation of teratoma. And the story is completely diff different when you have not a primary case, when you have a salvage surgery case um, that had already had a recurrence treatment with chemotherapy, then the um, amount of vital cancer and the residual disease um, comes up to 40%. So um, in those patients, and we see a lot of them after high-dose salvage chemotherapy, we don't use the border of one centimeter, so we perform surgery. So in summary for this first part of the talk, uh, in seminoma we only do surgery if the urethra is obstructed, if you want to remo remove the stent, which is, I think, a, a good indication for the young patients. And in non-seminoma, we strictly um, um, operate everyone above one centimeter, and in the salvage guys, we uh, make an individual decision and usually um, um, vote for surgery. Now, what's the standard of surgery? Um, we usually try to add surgery as early as possible. So usually after two or three weeks of after ke end of chemotherapy, we start with post-chemo because these two things belong together. If you expect teratoma, malignant elements, or vital cancer, you should not wait three or four months. Um, and um, the next question is, should we do it bilateral or um, is it sufficient to have a template resection? As you know, in Germany, um, Professor Heidenreich and me, we have published about eight years ago already a series of uh, bilateral, um, uh, of um, uh, unilateral template surgery, as opposed to the Americans, they always do uh, the bilateral approach. And the reason is actually what we have t seen in the first talk, um, to improve on the fertility and ejaculation afterwards. The question is, is this a safe approach and what kind of patients we can select for this? Um, first of all, we have to um, agree on the templates, and I use still the Donio templates, which are quite large, as you can see. The right side of the template always covers the interautocaval region, and even from the left side, I use a superficial pick of, of, of the inter, um, interautocaval region to be sure that there's no crossover. Um, but I can spare the nerves on the contralateral side um, by completely dissecting the template unilaterally. And this uh, comes up to uh, anti-grade ejaculation rates of 80 to 85%. So eight years ago, we published 150 patients together. Now we have another 120 or 114 patients in our series. 
Um, and you can see this makes only one third of patients, so it's not an um, approach for everyone. Um, we used it even in larger tumors, but um, sometimes it's very good to go to the own data and look it up. And um, the five recurrences and the two infield recurrences, they only happened in those patients with larger tumors. So sometimes you should believe what you have published eight years ago. Um, so five centimeter and unilateral should be um, the upper border of this indication, and then this um, approach seems safe. Does it make sense if you use a unilateral approach to do an ipsilateral nerve sparing? This, of course, is not always possible, but does it make sense at all? Yes, it makes sense. Um, I quote data um, that are a little bit older from the Norwegian group, and they saw in the normal patients with not, not having had chemotherapy that you increase um, your ejaculation rate to 90% if you do an ipsilateral nerve sparing. And the problem is if you don't do it and the patient uh, ends up with a uh, retrograde ejaculation, um, this is really a problem that is hard to solve. And I found data, as opposed to my um, um, previous speaker, um, that showed not such a good result of ele electro-ejaculation, probably because the definition was not quite right. Um, so if you only uh, damage one or two nerves, L1 or L2, then you have a retrograde ejaculation. Then usually you can retrieve sperms from the bladder. But if you damage L1 up to L4, then you have really a failure of emission. So you have no fluid at all in the urethra. And this really is a problem that you cannot really solve by ele electro ejaculation. So they did it in all these 22 patients. And finally, a good semen quality was achieved in only three of them. So I think this is a considerable um, a problem for these young patients because, as you heard, sperms will recover if you have a previous good sperm count. It takes two or three years, but uh, even after three cycles of chemotherapy, um, the young patients will be able to father children, um, but they need some nerves. And so um, you have to be aware of the anatomy. The sympathetic chains, chains are easily to identify it, um, during surgery. And um, if you can spare those, especially um, uh, running through the um, upper hypogastric plexus um, on one and better on two sides, then you will have um, um, a really ben benefit for the patients after surgery. The selection, as I told, is even harder for this kind of surgery. So you see this residual disease after three cycles of BEP, a patient we did three weeks ago. A um, little bit of problem was this uh, double artery of the left side for the kidney. Um, so it was very close to this, but we tried um, a nerve sparing approach. And here is um, the picture on this. You see with the blue vessel loops, the um, lower vessel loop is um, around the sympathetic chain. The upper is uh, the L3 um, nerve that is running um, after fusion over the iliac artery. And uh, here you can see, hopefully, um, that the dissection of this mass, which is still in total with the gonadal vessels, is possible. It's kind of a little micro dissection. We use very small clips. We don't use electrocautery. And uh, by this approach, we are able um, to at least save um, this nerve. It is not always necessary to serve, save all the nerves. It's important to have the most, most uh, the thickest nerve uh, that should be preserved. And in spite of nerve sparing, you can clear the whole field completely. So this is now the dissection of the tumor. Um, fortunately, this tumor um, finally was a necrotic one. Um, you see it is completely um, with the gonadal vessels. I always try not to make several pieces, but let um, the normal lymph um, flow and lymph node tissue in a hole. And here you can see the preserved nerves. Uh, in the bottom now you see the, the vessel, the uh, lower pole vessel to the kidney, and the whole template is, um, is cleared from lymphatic tissue and the nerve is preserved. But as you will be aware, this only is possible in very, very small tumors apart from um, the big vessels. This leads me to complications, the last part of this talk. Um, we have made um, considerable improvements over the last years. The Indiana data are now um, 15 years old, and we have compared our data um, uh, with less patients. And you can easily see that the um, frequent complications in the past, like um, pulmonary problems after surgery or wound infections, nearly have gone. We use fluid restriction. Um, we use a lower percentage of oxygen um, and fast-track surgery with no drains, no heparin. So people uh, are getting off the bed next day 
um, and this diminishes these general problems. However, uh, um, due to our patient collective, we see more lymphocytes, more urethral lesions from, from the seminomas nearly or exclusively, and more bleeding. Um, to come to two of those problems, lymphocele is a very frequent um, problem after this kind of surgery, um, but it, um, it doesn't need such a, a big, um, big solution. So um, these are two patients, one year post-op, one three years post-op without any complaint, and you just leave them alone. If they don't complain, if you have no obstruction of their vessels, you shouldn't treat those lymphocele. Um, the second is the bleeding, which usually is due um, to the percentage of patients that have caval infiltration of the tumor in your serious. Um, so we have about 20% of those patients, and the higher the percentage is, the higher the rate of bleeding after all is. In the middle picture, you see a um, quite interesting approach from USC Norris that do an endoscopy of the vena cava to see whether the uh, tumor really infiltrates. I haven't done this, but I think this is an interesting approach to verify whether you can take the cava or not. Um, do we have to really take out every thrombus? Yes, we do, because 50% uh, of those thrombi harbor um, the same vital residuals than the normal residual disease. So it's not always um, a, a normal thrombus, it's usually a tumor thrombus. And this is one case uh, where you directly on the picture can see the whole cava is obstructed, the collaterals are there, and you have residual disease to the aorta, which from this picture didn't seem uh, to be very tough. Um, the problem with this case is when we started surgery, and these are the gonadal vessels from the right side running into this large tumor, um, we knew, of course, that the cava would have to be resected, um, but we didn't encounter the problems on the aorta. And this is um, one of the messages of this later um, part of this talk. Um, this kind of surgery is really unpredictable. Um, so we have assumed that the uh, aortic infiltration was not present, and we just uh, um, filmed this because we th wanted to show a cable resection. Um, but the reason to, f um, to show you the film is now um, that um, it, is, it was very difficult to really dissect off the aorta from this tumor, um, which was primarily um, not a problem um, um, that we encountered. And this, the message is on the, on the MRIs or CT scans preoperatively, you, you never can see um, what's going to happen in this kind of surgery. And here you can see how stuck it is on the aorta. And um, we need some 10 seconds more to see this film because now I run into the, the wrong plane. Um, and sometimes it's um, really a problem. You see the vena, uh, the vena cava and the renal vein above, but here you see that the adventitia of the aorta um, is, not, is on the tumor, left on the tumor. So what you can see, this whitish tissue is already the media of the aorta. And when I showed this film to a vascular surgeon, he says, why, why, should, why did you leave this aorta in place? I should have re replaced it. And this is always the decision you have to make. And for this, you need, usually for this kind of surgery, um, colleagues that you can ask right away. This thrombus in the cava was not the problem. We resected the cava. This was, was not the case. But um, the summary of this is, um, you see here, this was the case, case one. Um, the cava was resected, um, and the aorta was not involved, really involved. In the second case, same picture, we had to take out the aorta. And for these circumstances, you just need a backup. And uh, this is the message of, uh, of these uh, small pictures. So it's not only the volume that matters. This has been proven in the Indiana series. We can see that the post chemo RPLD has a perioperative morbidity um, of nearly 6% if it's done in outside centers, periphery. Um, and in Indiana um, itself had 0.8 um, perioperative mort mortality of this disease. I think most important is um, the expertise um, um, of the surgeon. And um, this is hard to get because you just need some years of experience of this. And um, I'm very happy to quote Tim Christmas, um, whom I know knew personally very well. Um, and he, I think, made the best, um, um, the best wording uh, 10 years ago um, about this kind of surgery. To avoid cancer recurrence and reoperation, it's crucial that the first post chemo is careful, complete, preferably done in a center with expertise in this procedure. And I think this sums up um, what I want to tell you. And um, the development you made in UK to centralize this kind of treatment certainly is a benefit for those patients. With greetings from Düsseldorf, thank you very much.
anyone like to ask Peter a question? Peter, if, if someone comes back to clinic after an RPLND and they have problems with their ejaculation, um, do, how many of those patients just naturally recover their ejaculation over time? Or in that first clinic visit or second clinic visit, do you really have a view? Is, it, is that really how they're going to be? I only can remember one patient um, that recovered. recovered. Uh, and this patient already told me he had a small volume of ejaculate from the beginning on, and this improved over time. But if it is completely lost, and I think there's a big um, um, difference between a complete um, failure of emission and just a retrograde ejaculation. These are, is the damage of the nerves is different. Um, so as I told, if you have only one nerve damaged, it might be a retrograde ejaculation, um, but he still has an emission. Um, but he, if he has really a failure of emission, um, this certainly will not recover. And even in the retrograde ejaculation patients, I've seen only one patient that uh, recovered um, um, uh, spontaneously. Uh, con spontaneously. Um, I stopped using um, these, these uh, neuro medicines because they have uh, side, side effects uh, um, and uh, the sympathomimetics, um, I stopped using this and because I didn't see any effect of this. But this is my personal experience. I oversee several hundreds of those patients. So I think it's crucial that you know the anatomy. It's crucial that you at least try to spare one side of the, of the nerve's plexus. You have to be very careful if a tumor is around the, the ema um, where the upper hypogastric plexus is located. And so sometimes you really damage the plexus um, while doing a unilateral approach because you just cross over the border. And so you have to be very careful at this point. Um, in only rare instances, you can do an ipsilateral earth sharing in, in a unilateral um, field. Um, the patients we see usually have larger tumors so that you cannot do this. Okay. And just to add this, I, I didn't talk about laparoscopy um, because um, I'm, I'm not aware of any laparoscopic uh, surgeon who can spare nerves ipsilaterally. The problem is that you have to get behind the vessels, and for this you have to cut the lumbars, have, and, and the nerves directly run over the lumbar. So you have to dissect the nerve from the lumbar, which is a very tiny procedure. Um, and uh, if you talk to the laparoscopic surgeons, they usually don't do it. Very good. I think that was superb. I think we should move on. Thank you very much. Well, Peter's, Peter's shown the results and the techniques and the challenges that one of the world's best surgeons in this area faces. And now we have Matt Hayes to tell us how we're doing in the UK. Um, about four years ago, we commissioned a one-year um, audit of uh, RPLND in the UK. And uh, it's just been accepted for publication. Matt is, going, is the lead author on that paper and uh, wants to avail us of how we're doing in this operation. Matt, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and for asking me to follow such an auspicious uh, predecessor. Um, testicular cancer remains a significant healthcare challenge in the UK, uh, with more than 2,000 new cases diagnosed each year. And it generally impacts, as we've heard, on young men and their families at a critical point in early adult life. And although most will be cured, their treatment is often complex and requires a multidisciplinary approach, particularly in the face of metastatic disease. Uh, there are pretty long established criteria for surgery um, regarding RPLND in the UK. And generally this centers around the requirement to excise any radiologically significant residual mass which remains following systemic chemotherapy for non-seminomatous germ cell testicular cancer. Some men may relapse later during their surveillance or may require salvage surgery in rarer chemo-insensitive disease. Now you will see mine is not as big as Peter's. <laughs> However, you will see the fairly typical scenario where we've got an obstructed right ureter, which is somewhere in this lump with a hydronephrotic lower pole, a duodenum that's inseparable from the lump, a left renal vein that's obstructed by the mass, and just there, some intracaval tumor thrombus. So the capacity to deal with all these eventualities is critical to surgical success. Now, since uh, September of 2002, 
when NICE published improving outcomes in urological cancers. This surgery has been undertaken in certain centres which are required to serve populations of at least 2 million people. This surgery is directly commissioned by NHS England, so it doesn't go anywhere near clinical commissioning groups. And a recent service specification review has been undertaken, the outcome of which is awaited. The news is good. Partly as a consequence of this, outcomes for men in terms of survival really are excellent and comparable in the UK with the rest of the developed world. Services are currently provided from 17 centres distributed widely across the UK, with four in London and others in, as you'd expect, our major urban cancer centres. Based on a UK population of 64 million people or thereabouts, this equates to one centre per 3.7 million head of population. So what did we want to do? Well, most published series in the literature represent the experience of either single centres or single surgeons of world renown. Our aim was to establish an understanding of contemporary retroperitoneal lymph node dissection surgery from all centres undertaking it across the UK for a one-year period between March 2012 and March 2013 in order to attempt to set some sort of benchmark for our national practice. And I am, as you might imagine, extremely grateful for the enthusiastic support of all members of the BAUS RPLND group, the initial membership of which is displayed here. The group's expanded slightly since we started. All of whom very generously provided data on their patients and the surgery provided to them. So in that year, 162 men underwent retroperitoneal lymph node dissection in the UK. The surgery was undertaken by 22 surgeons working out of those 17 centres. And the average number of cases per centre was nine with a range from 2 to 32. 40% of these patients had significant preoperative morbidity, including ureteric obstruction, the presence of inferior vena caval tumor thrombus, pre-existing pulmonary emboli, renal impairment, and bleomycin pneumotoxicity. 75% of patients had undergone orchidectomy beforehand. The rest had a diagnosis made either on the basis of percutaneous biopsy of a metastasis, or markers alone. So most surgery was undertaken in men under the age of 50, as you might expect. In fact, 72% of men were under 40 years of age. And their surgery, generally speaking, was undertaken for a residual mass after chemotherapy for either good or intermediate prognosis disease. RPLND as a primary treatment modality was undertaken in 5% of men. So most men undergoing surgery had received either three or four cycles of chemotherapy with bleomycin etoposide and usually cisplatin beforehand, with smaller numbers receiving other regimens and second line chemotherapy. Nearly half of men underwent surgery more than 12 weeks following completion of their chemotherapy. And this was generally a reflection of concern around post-chemotherapy recovery rather than surgical capacity. The majority of men underwent open template dissection within the anatomical boundaries dictated by the laterality of their disease. 34% of these were bilateral. There was significant need for additional intraoperative visceral surgery, as you might imagine. Nerve sparing was undertaken in two-thirds of these men. Intraoperative blood loss was pretty respectable, averaging three to 500 mils, with average operating times of three to four hours for open cases. In terms of the resected specimen, following retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, almost half of men were found to harbour teratoma differentiated, TD, 
in their residual nodes, although this did range quite dramatically from 19 to almost 90 percent. Similarly, broad ranges were seen in the smaller numbers with either necrotic nodes alone or indeed with residual cancer. 92% of men were deemed to have had negative margins at histopathological examination. So how did we do? Well, the mortality in this series of 162 RPLNDs was zero in terms of perioperative death within 30 days. The average length of stay was five and a half days, but with a significant range, as you might expect. 86% of men required either no or less than two units of blood transfused. Four operations were deemed incomplete. Two men were found to have unresectable disease, one was abandoned for bleeding, and in one, the reason for incompleteness was not recorded. And in 77% of men, there was considered to be no residual disease left macroscopically. Where there was residual disease left, 10% of those had not yet had the location of their residual disease actively sought. 4% had intra-abdominal disease outside the template, 3% in the lungs, 3% were not recorded, and smaller proportions were in neck nodes residual within the template or on the basis of markers alone. Complications were recorded. Um, similarly compare well with the literature, I would suggest, with 73% of men experiencing no recorded complications. And with only one Clavian Dando grade 3B complication reported, which was a return to theatre for post-operative bleeding. Length of stay, as we've already described, was around six days. So how have we done since the initial cohort? Well, between 2012 and 2016, Baus very kindly agreed to continue to support the data collection. And to date, we have 422 retroperitoneal lymph node dissections entered on the registry by 30 surgeons across the same number of centers. However, there were 162 in the first year. So my concern is that in that four-year period, we may be seeing some under-reporting. And we know that the number of centres submitting data has unfortunately fallen off a little. In addition, and more disappointingly, our follow-up data is a little impoverished. So in 67.5% of patients, Although the initial cohort data is complete, there's no follow-up data recorded. 22% have one follow-up entry, and only 0.5% have four follow-up entries. So my ability to say very much about sexual dysfunction is, I'm afraid, a little limited. The data set was not set up to talk about erectile dysfunction, but we did ask about retrograde ejaculation. So pre-existing retrograde ejaculation was reported in 6.4% of men, with 75% of men saying they didn't, and in 18% it wasn't recorded. Following retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, the incidence of, a, of retrograde ejaculation was 6.6% of men. Now, N only equals 22, but in those who reported no preoperative retrograde ejaculation, but they did experience post-operative retrograde ejaculation, there was no clear relationship between um, the use of unilateral or bilateral nerve sparing. So in conclusion, I think we made a really very encouraging start to understanding the quality of provision of RPLND for germ cell tumour in the UK. I think evidence points to a high standard of surgery with no perioperative deaths, as we've discussed. Because it's a national collaborative audit, um, it must provide, I think, a more realistic viewpoint than results from single high-volume centres. It's the first in the world. But we have no meaningful medium 
long-term follow-up available as yet. My expectation, however, is that this will be forthcoming. I'm very grateful to all those men um, who have, over the years, given permission for their data to be collected, and in particular, to all my colleagues for having submitted it. Thank you very much.